All right, so we're continuing in chapter 18 and picking up with slide 33. And we had just finished talking about extracellular receptors. Uh, that would be our, our um, amino acid derivatives and our peptide-based hormones that can't actually enter the cell. So their receptors were on the outside. And then they activated a G protein second messenger system. Now we're going to talk about the intracellular receptors. So steroid hormones, again, they're going to bind to the receptors in the cytoplasm. And they're going to go with the receptor and bind directly to DNA. They're going to alter the rate of DNA transcription. And by altering the rate of DNA transcription, they can directly affect the activity and structure of the target cells because they're going to affect the synthesis of enzymes or proteins. So thyroid hormones will bind to receptors, and their receptors are actually inside the nucleus or, or on the mitochondria. Remember, mitochondria would affect um, energy, right, ATP production. And so they will activate genes or change rate of tr transcription and increase rates of ATP production. So your thyroid hormones, your T3 and T4, will raise your metabolism by demanding that your mitochondria produce more ATP. All right, so here is a steroid hormone, a cholesterol derivative. It comes right through the, site, the cell wall, uh, excuse me, cell membrane, sorry, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, and it binds to its receptor. And then the receptor hormone complex goes into the nucleus and affects the transcription of the DNA. And so it can cause more transcription or gene activation, which will give us more messenger RNA, which will lead to more protein synthesis, and that will change what's happening inside the cell. Thyroid hormone goes in, okay, it can bind to a receptor on the mitochondria, and that will rev up ATP production, or it can go all the way into the nucleus where it finds its receptor, and also bind to the DNA, just the same way that steroid hormones did, and they can control gene translation into proteins. Okay, so we have certain background levels of most of these hormones going all the time. And so they're, they're mainly controlled by the negative feedback process. So if the hormone level drops, well then we're going to have the drop be the, the stimulus that triggers for them to be produced and released. And the different things that can trigger hormone production and release are called humoral stimuli, which means that there's some change in the fluid outside the cells. Hormonal stimuli, which means one hormone can tell a gland to make a different hormone. Or neural stimuli, which would be the use of neurotransmitters. So, control of hormone secretion may involve only one hormone. So for humoral stimuli, you, have, you control the hormone secretion by the heart, pancreas, parathyroid gland, and digestive tract directly. So those... Uh, endocrine cells in those organs and tissues directly monitor the extracellular fluid and when they detect a change that is when they will then release their hormone. Hormonal stimuli may usually has more steps to it, may have one or two more intermediary steps and there's t at least two or often more hormones involved. And then in neural stimuli the hypothalamus is actually what's running the show. Okay? All right, so let's start introducing you to some of these organs. The pituitary gland, it is also called the hypophysis, and it lay, lies inside that little U-shaped bowl in the sphenoid bone known as the cella turcica. The cellar diaphragm is a membrane covering that isolates the pituitary from the rest of the brain cavity. It hangs below the brain area known as the hypothalamus, and it's connected to the hypothalamus by the infundibulum. It releases nine hormones, seven from the anterior pituitary, and two are released from the posterior side of the pituitary. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Now, I have to tell you a little secret. Whenever I draw the pituitary gland on the board, it almost always looks like testicles. It just does. So I'm glad I am only using the diagrams here in your book. So here is the hypothalamus. This would be your optic chiasm where the two optic nerves crisscross. And then here is this little 
stem, the infundibulum, and then this is the pituitary gland. Now the pituitary is a very unusual gland because it's actually made of two completely different origins of tissue. The entire back of the pituitary, the posterior pituitary, is more like nervous tissue. In the back of the pituitary, I have axons from neurons of the hypothalamus. And so this is just a completely nervous system connection between the hypothalamus, the axons of all those cells come down to the back of the pituitary. And it's actually these neuron cell bodies in the hypothalamus that create the neurohormones that are stored in the back of the pituitary waiting for release. And the trigger for release is an action potential coming down the axon. So the back of the pituitary is almost a continuation of the hypothalamus region of the brain. The back of the pituitary is also called the neurohypophysis because it is made of nervous tissue, neurohypophysis. The front or the anterior pituitary is called the adenohypophysis and it is made of true epithelial glandular type tissue. It actually creates the hormones that come out of the anterior pituitary. The ones that come out of the posterior pituitary are made by the brain region. The ones that come out of the anterior pituitary are made by the anterior pituitary itself. And it has three regions. It has the pars tuberalis, which is this part of the infundibulum. It has the pars distalis, which is this white belly, wide belly part. And then the pars intermedia is kind of between the anterior and posterior pituitaries, okay? The anterior pituitary is more like a true gland. It's going to um, react to releasing and inhibiting hormones that are going to come from the hypothalamus, and then it's going to release the hormones that it has created. And then you can see here, this is that little pocket in the sphenoid bone known as the cella turquica. If you saw my anatomy one videos, I was saying that wrong. Um, I was taught cella turcica but I went and, and looked at the origins of the word and it's supposed to refer to a Turkish saddle. So I'm gonna say it Turkica from now on, okay? So this is the cella Turkica. Okay, here's a microscope slide showing you the posterior pituitary, which is always lighter in color because it's myelinated axons. And then there's the pars intermedia and the pars distalis, both of those are part of the anterior pituitary, and they will always stain with more of a purplish or reddish color and less fibers. See, this is mostly fibrous, this is mostly cellular. Okay, so going above the pituitary, the hypothalamus, again, is a brain region. It is not an endocrine region, but it controls the endocrine system through the pituitary gland. It creates two neurohormones, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin, and it creates them in the brain. And then it puts them in vesicles and transports them all the way down through the infundibulum, down to the posterior pituitary, and they wait in the bottom of the axons for the action potential. The action potential will come down and it will tell this part of the posterior pituitary, these ends of these neurons, to release these two hormones into the bloodstream from the back of the pituitary gland. It also secretes regulatory hormones that will control the anterior pituitary gland, and we'll go into that in just a second, and it has autonomic centers that exert direct control over the adrenal medulla through the nervous system. Okay, so again, here is the hypothalamus. Here are, are the little neuron cell bodies of the ones that are making the neurohormones, and we're gonna transport them down the axons, and they're just gonna wait down here. And then once they get the signal, if the hypothalamus decides we need to release it, it will send an action potential, an electrical current, down the axon and cause the, the end of the neuron to release those neurohormones into the bloodstream. And remember, the two that are made and released are antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin, okay? It also will make regulatory hormones that will come down through the front of the infundibulum and will have a direct connection to the cells of the anterior pituitary, and that will tell the anterior pituitary whether to release or not release hormones. And then it has a direct nervous connection all the way to the adrenal medulla for releasing 
adrenaline and noradrenaline. All right, so the anterior lobe of the pituitary is also called the adenohypophysis, and the hormones turn on endocrine glands or help other organs in their functions. And it has three parts, pars distalis, that's the infundibulum part, pars tuberalis, that's the border between the anterior and posterior, and pars, excuse me, pars distalis is the bottom, pars tuberalis is the infundibulum, and pars intermedia is between the anterior and posterior. Near the attachment of the infundibulum, there's something called the median eminence. That's where the hypothalamic neurons release the regulatory hormones. And there is a little capillary system that runs only between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Now, a little capillary network within an organ that's not there to deliver oxygen from the circulatory system has a special name. It is called a portal system. We're going to learn about a portal system in the liver later on called the hepatic portal system. But this portal system connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary, which is called the hypophysis, remember? So are you ready? This is one of those Charlie Brown moments. The name of this little capillary network is called the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. So hypothalamic for hypothalamus hypophysial for hypophysis portal system and it's made up of fenestrated capillaries these are capillaries that have very big slits in between them for leakage so we want these neurohormone messages to come out and go into the anterior pituitary so we kind of put big holes in the capillary down by the anterior pituitary so again it is called the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system and that is just a little capillary network between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Now, when the anterior pituitary is going to release the hormones to go into the body, then it just puts them into the general blood vessels, the regular old circulation, not into the portal system. So here's a nice diagram. You can see here are our neurons for, that go through the back of the pituitary in the, in the infundib infundibulum. Okay, we're going to talk about that name in just a minute. And then this blue right here represents the portal system that runs from the hypothalamus into the anterior pituitary. So we would create the hormones up here in the hypothalamus, the releasing and inhibiting hormones, and they would be delivered into the portal system here, into the capillary network. And then they would flow down, and then they would reach the cells and diffuse out of the capillaries through the slits and go to the cells of the anterior pituitary and tell them what to do. And then the cells of the anterior pituitary would then secrete the hormones and they would leave and go into the general circulation. So again, this is called the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. All right, now let's go to the back of the pituitary again. We have a bundle of axons that are myelinated, that are part of the central nervous system. So what did we call that back in anatomy one? A bundle of axons inside the central nervous system was called a tract. Do you remember that word? And so the name for the backside of the infundibulum and how the hypothalamus uses electrical currents to talk to the posterior pituitary, this part right here, are you ready? The hypothalamic hypophysial tract. Okay, and so when the action potential comes down, those neurohormones that are stored in the bottom of these neurons simply put it into a blood vessel running through the back. And this is not part of the portal system. And this will just go into the general circulation. Okay. So, for the anterior pituitary, there are two different classes of hormones that tell the anterior pituitary what to do. There are releasing hormones, which tell the anterior pituitary to release something. And there are inhibiting hormones, which tell it, don't release it. Okay, and we use negative feedback in both cases. So this is an awesome graphic. I want you to look at this graphic a lot for this test. This one and slide 50 are gonna be really important, okay? So if you want, if the body wants 
to raise the amount of thyroid hormones in circulation. The, the hypothalamus senses that there is a drop in thyroid hormones. And so it creates something called thyrotropin releasing hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone is going to go to the anterior pituitary and tell the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. So where do you think that's going to go? If it's going to stimulate the thyroid, it has to go to the thyroid. And so thyroid stimulating hormone is released from the anterior pituitary, which goes to the thyroid gland and makes the thyroid gland create and release thyroid hormones. When enough thyroid hormones have been produced that the blood level of thyroid hormones goes up, then the level of high thyroid hormones will cause the hypothalamus to switch over to sending thyrotropin inhibiting hormone, which tells the anterior pituitary, we've had enough, you can stop now. See how that works? Okay. So again, thyroid, if you ever see the word tropin or tropic in a hormone name, it means that it's about to tell another gland to do something with its hormones. So, thyrox, th excuse me, thyrotropin releasing hormone is about to tell the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. This stands for corticotropic releasing hormone. And this one stands for gonadotropic releasing hormone. Okay, so ultimately this is going to affect the adrenal cortex and ultimately this is going to affect the gonads. That's what those are for. So the hormones that come out of the anterior lobe are thyroid stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, prolactin, growth hormone, and gonadotropins. Okay. Also, in the gonadotropins, that includes follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and then the condition of hypogonadism is when we don't have enough gonadotropins going to the gonads and they don't release enough hormones. Okay, I'm sorry, it was slide 51 that you really want to look at for the test. This is like a summary slide of the entire chapter. These are all the different hormones, who is controlling them, right? And what they produce and what organs they affect. All right, so I'm going to stop this presentation now and we will pick up with slide 52 in the next one.